Hello, um, welcome to this uh, new tax talks. I'm Pascal Santamon, the head of the Center for Tax Policy and Administration, and I'm happy uh, not to see you, but to welcome you to this uh, um, webcast so that we can uh, brief you on the latest development on the international tax agenda. Uh, you will see that there are a number of uh, people from the team who will brief you on different uh, topics. So join the discussion. You can send questions to these uh, addresses and uh, we'll save 10 to 15 minutes at the end of the webcast to try to respond to all your questions. And uh, if we have not, we'll try to follow up anyway with you. Topics of the days of the day will be one, the update on the G20. I'm just back from Berlin, where the German presidency held its uh, first uh, meeting at the deputy level. Uh, we'll uh, update you on the inclusive framework on BEPS as regards the membership, but also the activity. Uh, you will then have a longer session, probably 20 minutes, on the multilateral instrument, which I think has been the big news uh, since uh, there was agreement on the text, which is now open to signature. And finally, uh, Giorgia Maffini will brief us on tax policy matters and in particular on tax certainty because you have some homework to do there and we remind you of that. To start with the update uh, on the G20. So the first meeting of the uh, German presidency of the G20 was held in Berlin last week. It was preceded by a seminar um, on different topics and, and there were three panels on tax topics, one on digital economy and taxation, one on tax and development, uh, and one on tax certainty, which gives a flavor of what, of, what is of interest uh, of the uh, German presidency in the area of international taxation. And the day after was the meeting of the deputies. For those of you who are not that familiar with the G20 um, uh, circuit, uh, we do have finance ministers meeting, uh, but these finance ministers meetings are prepared by the deputies, generally speaking, the uh, uh, DG for Treasury uh, who meet and they spend the whole day on the 1st of December and one of the sessions was on international tax. What was on the agenda of that session? One, <clears throat> the issue of transparency with a lot of emphasis put by the G20 countries on the need for countries to implement their commitments on exchange of information on requests. We reported on the uh, Global Forum um, meeting, plenary meeting in Tbilisi a few weeks ago, the fact that all the um, peer reviews have now been completed, uh, that countries got uh, ratings, and that uh, in view of preparing for the list that the G20 asked, uh, for us to prepare for June 17, July 17, actually, for the summit, um, we indicated that there will be a, a speed uh, track uh, procedure, fast track procedure for countries to get recognition of the progress made by April, May 2017, so that the list be updated <clears throat> and actually shortened as, as necessary uh, to reflect the progress made by countries. The second big topic was BEPS implementation with still a lot of pressure and interest from the G20 in having a soft, consistent and fast implementation of the minimum standards and beyond the minimum standards of all the BEPS actions. Tax and development is quite important, in particular in Africa, and I understand that the German presidency will push for a tax compact and a compact, broadly speaking, in, in Africa. Finally, and interestingly, um, a big emphasis on tax certainty by the German presidency. You will remember that um, the Chinese presidency of the G20 organized a tax policy seminar in Chengdu in July, and this was reflected in the communique of G20 finance ministers, but also of G20 leaders in September, so that there would be work on tax policy, generally speaking, with two main elements, one on inclusive growth and the other on tax certainty. And the German G20 presidency has decided to make tax certainty one of its, uh, the highlights of its uh, presidency. Finally, and, and a bit surprisingly, I would say, um, uh, there is um, um, a big emphasis put by the German presidency on tax and digitization. Uh, they would like uh, us to report to the March uh, finance minister's meeting 
on what's at stake there, on the work of the task force on the digital economy, but maybe with some ideas on the way forward. This reflects the big interest which had been expressed by G20 leaders in Hangzhou when they met with most of the leaders mentioning this issue of, of key uh, interest uh, to them. Next steps there for the German presidency, very simple. There will be the G20 finance ministers meeting in March, 17th and 18th of March, and then the leaders in July. You know it's a shortened presidency because of the election to take place in September in Germany. So we'll work fast on that, uh, but all these different topics uh, will be delivered. Now, let's move to the inclusive framework on BEPS. Um, a couple of things, actually three main items uh, there to be discussed. One, the latest development I will take care of. Then the peer review mechanisms uh, I will then turn to Arim Prost so that he can brief you on what has been done, in particular on Action 5. It's the form on harmful tax practices continuing its work, but uh, I would say more importantly because that's new, on Action 13 and on Action 14, and uh, you will have seen that uh, we've come out with uh, some elements on, on Action 14. And finally, the multilateral instrument, I guess that most of you would like to hear about that. Uh, we'll have uh, Gita Kotari, uh, who has been involved in all the negotiation, and Michael Evers, who is taking over from Jesse Eggert, who unfortunately had to leave us uh, for personal reasons, but uh, Michael will be uh, involved, so they will uh, try to explain to you how to read this instrument so that you get more familiar, but I'm pretty sure that this topic will remain high on the uh, tax uh, agenda of the tax geeks that most of you are. If you're listening to us, is that because you're a tax geek. Uh, the inclusive framework on BEPS. Um, membership has increased since last we spoke. Uh, last week, or in the past two weeks, we had three new members, namely uh, Macau, China, uh, Ukraine, and Mauritius. We very much welcome them. We expect to have still uh, around 100 members by the end of January, which will be the uh, next uh, plenary meeting. Um, just for your information, there will be on the 13th of December a meeting uh, of financial secretaries of Caribbean jurisdictions in the British Virgin Islands. We had many questions from zero tax jurisdictions on what role they should play in the inclusive framework, whether they should join or not, and that's a topic we will be discussing with them. The inclusive framework started in June, as you know, in Kyoto. Since June, uh, the different working parties have been working uh, very intensively so that they would be able to deliver for the next meeting of the inclus uh, inclusive framework, the next plenary, which will be at the end of January 2017. This is exactly the same pace as the Committee on Fiscal Affairs, as the inclusive framework is the Committee on Fiscal Affairs open to all interested and committed uh, countries. So the different working parties have primarily focused in on establishing terms of reference, and methodologies to start the peer reviews of the minimum standard, but also on the working party two on tax policy to try to figure out how to measure the impact of BEPS measures across the world and how to monitor the legislative changes which have taken place. So uh, we will put the focus uh, on two of these um, main uh, peer review mechanisms, uh, namely uh, action 13 and action 14, and that's where I will turn to Arim. Thank you, Pascal. Um, I'm taking it over now, pressing the button, moving to the next slide. As Pascal has indicated, I'm going to talk about where we are on the peer review of the four BEPS minimum standards. You know that there's a package of 15 actions out of which uh, four are so-called minimum standards. So all of the countries have come in and committed to implement and have reviewed the implementation of those four minimum standards. What are they? They are Action 5, as Pascal has mentioned, that's harmful tax practices. Action 6, 
uh, treaty abuse, action 13, and within action 13, really the country by country report, you know that action 13 is wider, it's transfer pricing documentation, there's a local file, a master file, but it's the country by country report itself that is the part that is a minimum standard. And then also action 14, uh, which is dispute resolution, and here again the minimum standard is the peer review of MAP, the mutual agreement procedure, not the part on arbitration, but that's now taken up by the multilateral instruments, of which we will hear more later. So those are the four minimum standards, and that slide should just give you a brief snapshot uh, in terms of where we are on the review with respect to those four actions. So on harmful tax practices action five, there's been ongoing work and continuing work on reviewing, we're in the process of reviewing patent boxes, IP regimes, preferential regimes, and of course also the transparency framework. If you are in an EU member state, uh, you will be familiar with this as well because there's a parallel exercise within the EU, the code of conduct that also looks at regimes and in particular important here, we work very closely with our colleagues here. So the review on the patent boxes is based on the same nexus approach that's also used in the code exercise. So we should be coming to consistent results and on the transparency framework, the exchange of rulings, of course, within Europe that's been implemented by way of a directive already. Uh, the second is action six, as we say here, treaty abuse, as it says here, review will follow the MLI. Um, and so, so it's now the MLI first, and then we're going to look at the review in a later time. It should be a relatively high level review in any case, because it will be available information from the treaty network of countries in the inclusive framework, which then for today leaves us mainly with respect to action 13, and action 14. As it says here on action 13, country by country reporting, uh, the start of the review is expected in 217. And in fact, action 14, probably not a surprise, perhaps a surprise or coincidence, it actually started earlier today. We've sent out uh, the first questionnaire, we have pressed a button, we have launched on this uh, Monday, I hope it is, yes, um, we've launched the action 14 review and going to talk about in a moment. So what I'm going to focus in the remaining seven and a half minutes is action 13 and action 14. First on action 13, um, there's a number of elements. Yes, and Pascal is pressing the button, so I'm pressing on. Um, there's a number of elements that we're doing. One, it's what you see on this slide here, we continue to issue guidance whenever there is a need to issue guidance to ensure that we implement on time but also consistently for the benefit of businesses and tax administrations alike. And so for those of you that continuously check out our website, and I'm sure that's all of you, mm. you will have seen that earlier today, we have issued further guidance. In fact, what we have issued is consolidated guidance. So there's one document that combines the June guidance with the updated December guidance. The, the new piece, if you wish, of the guidance is twofold. One, there's a number of additional countries that will allow, and we specified the names of those countries, that will allow voluntary parent filing, i.e. that means where um, they don't otherwise in their mandatory regime fully cover the first financial year of 2016. It is possible in those countries to file in the parent jurisdiction on a voluntary basis, something that we already issued in June with respect to a number of countries. There's now more country allowing you as an m and in a country that doesn't implement otherwise for 2016 to do it on a voluntary basis. That is one piece. And the other piece is something to do with notification. Um, a number of countries have implemented um, the uh, CBC requirements including uh, notifications to identify the reporting entity uh, for the m and &E group. And in a number of jurisdictions, the date for such notification has been put at the end of uh, the financial period for which uh, reporting is due, and that makes it the end of December. Now, the problem with that is, as we recognize, that that puts m &Es in a practical difficulty because for exercising that notification, they need to have certain information that may not be in their possession because to know whether you are the reporting entity or not, 
in that particular instance, you may need to know whether competent authority exchange agreements have been put in place. And in many instances, they haven't been put in place. So what the guidance now says that if countries want to move that date out or otherwise bring in transition belief, then that is fully consistent with the Action 13 standard. So they could put the date back, for instance, to the date of filing of the tax return or filing of the CBC report without violating the standard because the standard does not require notification, also doesn't require the date to be the date um, at the end of the period for which it relates. So that's something uh, that we have recognized that there was a difficulty in some sense and we're providing guidance that allows country to move um, that date back for a transition period to take account of the difficulties that otherwise MEs will be faced with. Um, so that's the notification piece. If there are other issues that will come to our attention to which we will also need to give guidance, we will do that. We welcome any questions for guidance. In fact, we will have a meeting starting tomorrow in Berlin, where amongst other things, we will be discussing further issues that have come in for potential issuance of guidance, as well as discuss the terms of reference um, and the methodology for the peer review, uh, which uh, we would expect, as I said in the previous slide, which we would expect to begin in 2017. So that's the guidance bit that we issued today, and that's a brief word on the peer review and uh, when it's about to commence. One uh, second piece also that for those that go to our website on a regular basis will have already seen, we have also today issued information on a number of countries to give you an indication um, of where do we stand on global implementation on Action 13, and again, with respect to the country-by-country country reporting. So it shows you the jurisdiction, whether the primary law is enforced, the secondary law, what's the first fiscal year that is covered, whether local filing is required, if it is, with respect to which period, whether surrogate filing is available, and then also broken out separately, whether that country where there is a need allows for parent surrogate filing, i.e. voluntary filing, in the parent jurisdiction itself. We've done this for uh, the first countries for which we have information. It's not every country. We will provide further updates as and when the information comes in, but we thought it is important that you have overall information on where we stand um, as we move forward on Action 13. I am moving on with my remaining four minutes to Action 14. Um, Dispute resolution. This is the first slide. I could spend a lot of time on that first slide. I won't. The important part of the slide is just to tell you that MAP is a piece, an important piece of a larger suite of measures that we're working on to prevent and where they arise, help resolve disputes. It has the preventing disputes. You see that on the, on the upper part of the slide here, that's on the OEC tax agenda and very much also on the tax certainty agenda. So that's a very important piece trying to focus as early as you can so that disputes don't even arise, so you don't have to resolve them. And then the important parts that we've done on MAP, on arbitration and arbitration, of course, in particular through uh, the multilateral instrument. The documents that we have released, you've seen them. There's documents in the peer review. Um, we have a minimum standard. It will be reviewed. The peer review will begin in 2016. First results will be published in 2017. They're based on terms of reference and an assessment methodology, all of which has been approved. It has been released. It's on our website. It's available. There is two other pieces that I will quickly mention. One is the MAP statistics reporting framework. Uh, that is important. As people say, only what gets measured gets done. And in order to make sure that we measure accurately and consistently, we have a new methodology here. And also we have a MAP profile on our website. Running through those in reverse order, the new MAP profiles are now available. Go on our website, see all countries of the inclusive framework sooner or later will be on. We're gathering the information. A lot of countries are already available. Here you have the link. There is very useful information available on the uh, uh, MAP regimes in all countries of the inclusive framework. The second is the MAP statistics reporting framework. Importantly, 
um, as you will have seen today, statistics have come out still under the old framework, but even that tells you that if you look at the last 10 years, closing inventories are up by more than 160%, clearly indicating that there is need to do something. Here you have uh, the details of the new reporting framework. I think it's important. I'm not going to take you through the details. They would go beyond the time, but there will be new statistics coming out that will give you a higher level of consistency and a higher level of transparency, including also on jurisdiction by jurisdiction reporting. These are the terms of reference. You know them. I am just clicking through here. It ranges from preventing disputes, availability and access to MAP, resolution of MAP cases, and implementation of MAP agreements. That's already in uh, the minimum standard as it was agreed and has been translated into terms of reference. The assessment methodology follows a two-stage approach. Um, I'm not going to walk you through this here, but you'll see it. The formal launch is today with respect to the first batch of countries. There is an evaluation of the legal framework, the MAP program, the practices, and then there is a stage one report in 2017, followed by a stage two report later on. This is the last slide, so I'm in my time. Just to remind you that this assessment schedule is available on our website. Uh, we are encouraging taxpayers, business association, individual companies from making contribution. There's a specific questionnaire on the website available. So if you have insights into the MAP regime as the user of MAP, as you are as a taxpayer, please share those insights, whether they're good, whether they're bad, whatever they might be, so they can be taken into account in the process of the peer reviews, which has started today with respect back to the first batch, as you can see here, the six countries on the left, and I give it over to Pascal. Yes, th thank you, Arim. Uh, <clears throat> just one additional word uh, to what Arim has explained. We strongly believe that this peer review on Action 14 is going to be the game changer to actually really improve dispute resolutions. It's not only about dispute resolutions, so about preventing disputes. But we all know that so far tax administrations have not been good, broadly speaking, on that. And it was largely because not enough attention was paid to something where there is no legal obligation to eliminate double taxation. This review mechanism, which will be made public and which will be reported to the G20 leaders and all interested stakeholders, will actually put the pressure on the decision makers in this area to put the resource, to put the attention, and to actually come to an outcome which is satisfactory and which will be reported publicly as good. So we do think that it's, it's a game changer, uh, and uh, we'll see that quickly. And that's why it's also important that you have this schedule uh, in mind so that you can input, you can express your views, and uh, this will be part of the pressure which needs to be exercised in this area. And I can tell you that the German presidency of the G20 in the meetings we've had so far has really put a lot of emphasis uh, in there, noting, by the way, that they may also need to be better at eliminating double taxation, but you see that it's a collective exercise which is taken seriously. Now, we'll turn um, to uh, Gita and uh, Michael uh, to go through the multilateral instrument, which is probably the highlight of this webcast. Thank you, Pascal. So the multilateral convention to implement tax treaty related measures to prevent BEPS was the text was adopted on Thursday, the 24th of November. It's now publicly available along with an explanatory statement on our website. <clears throat> As you know, the BEPS package included a number of measures which require changes to the model tax conventions used to negotiate bilateral tax treaties, but also require changes to the existing network of more than 3000 <laughs> bilateral tax treaties. In line with Action 15 of the BEPS package, the multilateral instrument will allow countries to swiftly implement the BEPS measures in their existing tax treaties in both a synchronized and a harmonized way. The adoption of the text on Thursday the 24th of November means that the negotiation has been concluded and that countries have agreed that this is the text which will go forward for signature. So the first question which you might ask is why did countries uh, agree to use a multilateral treaty for this purpose? And of course, we explored the alternative uh, solutions. The first option would have been to use the usual approach and for pairs of countries to go away and bilaterally renegotiate their tax treaties in order to implement the BEPS measures. The advantage of this approach would have been to, <clears throat> to allow maximum flexibility for treaty partners to choose the way in which they wanted to implement the BEPS measures. 
However, the major drawback of this approach is the time and resources necessary to bilaterally negotiate more than 3,000 tax treaties. It could take decades. So the second option, which has been explored in the past, is a model protocol to amend tax treaties. This would have the advantage of increased efficiency as opposed to the first approach. However, it would still require significant time and resources in order to adapt the whole treaty network and have those changes ratified by Parliament. So the third option which was retained was a multilateral treaty which sits on top of and modifies bilateral tax treaties. <clears throat> this allows all bilateral treaties to modify simultaneously and in a harmonized way. Instead of many different negotiations, there's only one negotiation which represents a huge efficiency gain. It also means that countries only need to go to their, to their parliament once to modify their whole treaty network. And although the use of a multilateral treaty to modify bilateral tax treaties is unprecedented, it's not unprecedented in other areas. And one area here is in, the, is in extradition treaties where a multilateral convention between the EU and the US modified the provisions of bilateral extradition treaties between all EU members and the United States. So coming to the next question, what does the multilateral instrument do? It covers four of the BEPS actions. First, it allows countries to implement the minimum standards on both Action 6 on prevention of treaty abuse and Action 14 on improving dispute resolution. The minimum standards, as you know, means that countries have agreed that the standard must be implemented. It also allows countries to implement the other tax treaty related measures on Action 2 on hybrid mismatches and Action 7 on avoidance of PE status. Finally, it contains an opt-in set of provisions on mandatory binding mutual agreement procedure or MAP arbitration and the BEPS Action 14 reports provided that this would be developed as part of the negotiation on the MLI. So what are the key features of this multilateral treaty? And the first question is, how was it developed? The MLI was negotiated in, in a freestanding ad hoc group composed of over 100 countries and jurisdictions. It was open to all interested countries which participated on an equal footing. There were six negotiation sessions starting in May 2015, and as, as I mentioned, the text of the convention was adopted on the 24th of November 2016. Since the substance of the BEPS tax treaty-related measures had already been agreed, the role of the ad hoc group was to determine how the MLI would need to modify the provisions of the bilateral treaties in order to implement those measures. And there again, with the exception of the provisions on bind mandatory binding map arbitration, which were developed during the negotiation by a specific subgroup which worked both on the substance of the provisions and on the modalities of their implementation in bilateral tax treaties. How does the MLI work? The MLI will modify tax treaties between two or more parties to the convention. It has the potential to modify thousands of bilateral tax treaties, and even if it were to modify 100 treaties, this would still represent a significant saving of time and resources for countries. The MLI doesn't function like an amending protocol which directly amends the wording of a bilateral treaty, rather it sits on top of the bilateral treaty and modifies its application in order to implement the BEPS measures. This is an application of the later in time rule in Article 30 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which provides that if there are two treaties on the same subject matter with the same parties, the provisions of the later treaty will prevail. In order to reflect variations between tax treaties and country preferences, the MLI provides for flexibility in the form of lists of covered tax agreements, reservations, i.e. opt-outs, and options, choices between different provisions. And we'll come to this in more detail uh, in a moment. Now, although the MLI may be a complex instrument, that complexity was inevitable given the current framework of thousands of tax treaties with varying language. It was impossible to take the usual approach in protocols of listing the specific article by article changes to each provision of the treaty. However, the MLI will provide clarity. It sets mm -hmm. out all the different options which can be taken and the consequences on the tax treaty of each possible scenario, including the consequences of any mismatch between the options chosen by each party to the tax treaty. Accordingly, once you have the options chosen by each party, which will be made publicly available, anyone can apply the MLI to identify the specific changes to a covered tax agreement. The MLI will also provide transparency. We'll ensure that the changes made to tax treaties are transparent for tax administrations and taxpayers by using different tools, including fact sheets on different provisions, sample consolidations, and a database to show how the MLI is applied to a specific tax treaty. And we'll say more about this later on. The final point on the slide relates to the languages of the MLI. 
and as you may have noticed, the authentic languages of the MLI are English and French. It's normal that multilateral treaties are concluded in a limited number of languages because it would be unworkable to have an authentic language in the language of each country. If you can imagine the negotiations of a UN treaty, it would be uh, unworkable. And it also increases the risk of consist inconsistency between different language versions. Now, if we apply that to bilateral tax treaties, an estimated 80% of tax treaties have an authentic version in English, and probably around 90% have an authentic version either in English or in French. However, we do know that bilateral tax treaties exist in around 45 languages for the current members of the ad hoc group. Accordingly, there's a difference between the authentic languages of the MLI and the authentic languages of the underlying tax treaties. And the way in which this difference will be addressed is through the production of translations of the MLI into other languages. And this process is already underway with the countries in the ad hoc group already preparing translations into other languages. Many countries will, in any case, need to produce a translation of the MLI for the purposes of their ratification procedures. And once that translation has been produced, you're essentially in the same situation as if you have a bilateral tax treaty in English or in French. So moving on to the forms of flexibility in the MLI. The first way in which the MLI provides flexibility is that a party can specify the tax treaties to be modified by the MLI, which are called covered tax agreements. And we use the word agreements because it covers treaties, but also other kinds of, of uh, agreements and arrangements. For example, those concluded with a, a non-state jurisdiction. While the intention of the MLI is that it should apply to the maximum number of tax treaties, a party may decide to exclude a specific treaty. For example, if it's recently been re renegotiated or it's under renegotiation in order to implement the BEPS measures. Accordingly, each party will provide a list of the treaties which it wishes the MLI to cover. And the MLI will modify the treaty only if both contracting jurisdictions have listed it. Second, for a provision that implements a BEPS minimum standard, opting out is only possible if a party's tax treaties already meet the minimum standard. However, in cases where a minimum standard can be met in multiple ways, the MLI allows parties to adopt a different approach to the one set out in the MLI. And in these cases, the parties must use their best efforts through bilateral negotiation to reach a solution consistent with the minimum standard. Third, for provisions that don't reflect a minimum standard, a party can generally opt out from all or part of the provision by making a reservation. If a reservation is made, that MLI article or part of it will not apply as between the reserving party and all other parties to the, co to the convention. That means that reservations apply symmetrically. Fourth, in certain cases, the MLI allows a party to opt out of applying a provision to a subset of tax treaties in order to maintain existing provisions which have a certain characteristic which is objectively defined in the MLI. For example, a party can opt out of the application of Article 6 of the MLI for its tax treaties which already include preamble language describing the intent to eliminate double taxation without creating opportunities for non-taxation or reduced taxation. In these cases, the party must provide a list of the tax treaties which fall within this category. Finally, the MLI provides for a choice between different alternatives in cases where the BEPS work produced multiple ways to address a BEPS issue. It also provides for optional provisions in cases where the BEPS work resulted in a main provision that could be supplemented with an additional provision. These alternative or optional provisions generally only apply if both contracting jurisdictions choose to apply them. There are certain exceptions to this rule where asymmetrical application is permitted if both parties agree to that. The mechanism of opting in is also used for part six of the MLI, which includes the provisions on mandatory binding map arbitration. So part six will only apply if both contracting jurisdictions to a tax treaty choose to apply part six. So looking now at the structure of the MLI, you'll see on the slide a table of contents, starting with the preamble, which sets out the intentions behind the conclusion of the MLI. Part one uh, defines the terms which are used Part two addresses action two on hybrid mismatches. Part three deals with action six on prevention of treaty abuse. Part, um, part four includes measures related to action seven on avoidance of permanent establishment status. Part five addresses action 14 on improving dispute resolution. And part six sets out those opt-in provisions on mandatory binding map arbitration. At the end of the instrument, you have part seven, which includes the final provisions, which basically sets out the mechanics of the MLI. How does it work? When does it enter into, for into force? When do the changes enter into effect? 
What's important to bear in mind when reading the MLI is that the instrument is not intended to be read from cover to cover as a standalone multilateral treaty. Since its purpose is to modify bilateral tax treaties, it's a multilateral instrument which needs to be read in a bilateral way. Accordingly, you need to take a specific bilateral treaty along with the choices made by the treaty partners and then systematically apply uh, the provisions of the MLI to determine the changes uh, which are made to the tax treaty. And here I'll hand over to my colleague Michael to take you through how the MLI applies in some specific cases. Thank you, Gita. I, I think this is where definitely all the... Yeah. Thank you, Gita. This is definitely where all the tax geeks will <laughs> wake up again because they immediately recognize some of uh, some very familiar provisions either from the action report um, from, from the BEPS package or provisions that were already uh, in the OECD model convention but that were not yet included in uh, bilateral treaties. Um, if we look into more detail in, in the various parts that um, Gita just highlighted, we see, for example, the part two on hybrid mismatches. Uh, most of that work was done under action two, but of course there was also definitely a link with action six, as we will see that some of the provisions that are included in part two um, come from the action six report, actually. Um, as said, you will see familiar provisions when we look at the first uh, article, that is Article 3 in this case, where um, countries can now choose to add a new paragraph to uh, Article 1 on persons covered to address transparent entities. But also, in the same context, it would be wise to look carefully at the um, provisions on elimination of double taxation um, to change the exemption or credit method that has been included by your, um, um, in, in your covered tax agreement. There's also a provision that relates to the interaction with the savings clause. The savings clause is another provision elsewhere in the multilateral instrument. So as I said, if you go through the text part by part, um, together with reading the uh, bilateral agreements, you find a lot of familiar provisions and you can see one by one on how they relate with the existing uh, treaties. Uh, same applies, for example, to the dual, resident, the, uh, dual residence, the tiebreaker of Article 4.3 of the OECD Model Convention, where the alternative tiebreaker in the past had been already included in the OECD commentary. It has now been upgraded to um, the um, OECD Model Convention, at least that's the uh, proposal under Action 2 and Action 6. Um, without going into much detail, it was just to illustrate that if you go through the instrument part by part, treaty by treaty, you see a lot of familiar features where there are a lot of policy options. We'll look at the specific mechanisms on how to apply these individual articles a little bit later on, because I first want to highlight also one of the most important substantive provisions of the MLI, um, that is of course the set of provisions to update existing treaties to meet the minimum standard of Action 6 uh, to address in particular uh, treaty shopping cases. Just first as a reminder, um, it's good to see, uh, to look at the, the core elements of that standard. Um, it is good to remind you that there, um, there are various options in which a given country can meet minimum standard. Uh, first option would be to include a principal purpose test. Another option would be to have that principal purpose test, but then supplemented by a limitation on benefit, benefits provisions, either a simplified one or a more extensive version. Finally, countries could also decide to have a detailed LOB provision in their treaties, but then they should be careful to also include uh, special provisions that address uh, common conduit arrangements. How does that translate then to the MLI? Um, of course, as Gita has already explained, there is a lot of flexibility in the MLI, and that's what you will see here as well. Of course, countries need to meet the minimum standards, but the way in which they do that um, can vary. So they have different options. For example, they can choose to indeed implement just the principal purpose test. Alternatively, they could combine the principal purpose test with the simplified LOB provision that is included in the MLI as well. Finally, as we will see a little bit later on, there is an option to opt out of the principal purpose test as long as you uh, endeavor to include in your bilateral treaties a detailed um, uh, LOB or decide to meet the minimum standard in another way. So again, flexibility on how you reach the minimum standard, but of course we see that over 19 countries and jurisdictions have already um, committed to implement that minimum standard. 
it's also important to look at um, some new provisions, provisions you haven't seen before, but that are now included in part four of the MLI. Those are the provisions that are very important for taxpayers all around the world. It is one of the important building, p building blocks of improving um, dispute resolution. These are the provisions that provide a legal basis for mandatory binding arbitration in MAP cases. Um, countries can decide to opt in or opt out, so can choose to opt in for um, the provisions in this part now or, or even later on. Uh, we assume that the countries who have already committed to implement arbitration will indeed choose to opt in for the provisions of this part six. So what is in there? Um, a lot. Um, but just to summarize, uh, there are two kinds or two types of arbitration included there. There is so-called final offer arbitration, also known as ba baseball arbitration. That's the default rule, but alternatively, um, countries can also decide to go for independent uh, opinion arbitration. There is one additional note I would like to make on flexibility here, because as Akim also said, this is only just one part of a broader effort to in, uh, improve dispute resolution. Um, that requires also that there is a lot of flexibility. So although the MLI will provide a legal basis, competent authorities will have a lot of uh, flexibility in practice. So that is all I wanted to say at this point on the substantive provisions, but it's also good to explain the mechanisms. Again, we're talking about lengthy provisions, 48 pages in total, but if you look at them article by article, you'll see a set of common building blocks that um, make up all the, these articles. First of all, you will also see, uh, always see uh, one or more substantive provisions, sometimes even including different options. So here I brought an example of country Y that is now choosing to apply the MLI and um, looking into the various options it has under, for example, Article 13. Article 13 of the MLI um, helps to implement the outcomes of the Action 7 work. And there we see that um, with regard to Article 5, Paragraph 4 of the OECD Model Conventions, two alternative provisions have been developed. Again, this is a very flexible instrument, so here countries have the choice to go for either option. Let's see what are these options. It's almost like an app on, on your iPhone, if you look at, this like, uh, look at this like this. We have an option A to just implement what will be the new Article 5.4 of the OECD Model Convention. There's also an alternative that will be included in the OECD commentary. Suppose country Y chooses this option. Then there's also a second substantive provision. Um, that is the provision to prevent uh, abuse of Article 5 through fragmentation schemes. So after those substantive provisions, you will find in each article a so-called compatibility clause. And that is a, a provision that basically explains the interaction between those substantive articles and the articles that you already have in your bilateral tax treaty. There's more flexibility in most of the articles, and that is the flexibility offered by making reservations. So for example, country Y here has the option to reserve on the entire Article 13. It can also choose to uh, reserve on option A, but then only for certain covered tax agreements. Finally, um, country Y in this case could choose not to apply the new provision uh, against fragmentation schemes. So suppose that is the case. Then country Y can basically switch off what is Article 13, Paragraph 4 of the MLI. Well, then there's a, a set of articles that really give the clarity that the MLI needs to work in practice. That is the requirement to notify the depositary and therewith the entire world on the choice for option A in this case. And there's also another notification clause to give even more clarity and certainty. And that applies to uh, which, which provisions in existing treaties of country Y will be changed because country Y would need to identify in, their, in the existing treaties what provisions will be updated to now uh, comply with option A. So it will make the notification, we'll send it to the OECD, that is the depository, and we can inform the, basically the entire world, so all taxpayers, about the new status of uh, the tax treaties of country Y. Now, of course, this is only country Y. Of course, we're talking about updating bilateral treaties. Um, we look at what will happen in, um, when, you, when you do the matching a bit later on. I first wanted to uh, highlight again the importance of the Action 6 minimum standards. 
where you will also have different options, as I just explained, to um, update bilateral treaties to comply with the minimum standard. So for example, country Y could here simply choose for the principal purpose test. That's quite straightforward. Also here you see that there are a couple of reservations. Just to connect to what I was just saying, um, choosing the possibility to um, go for an alternative to apply uh, or to implement an LOB bilaterally or to reserve in certain cases for certain treaties. For example, for the treaties that already comply with Action uh, 6. So as promised, I um, want to say something about the uh, matching exercise, because we only looked at what would happen in the case of country Y. But if we would have, let's say, country X as well, we first have to see if their bilateral treaty is indeed covered by the MLI. Um, both countries deliver to us a list of treaties they want to uh, cover by this agreement. And what do we see here? Indeed, country X and country Y both have listed the same treaty. That's the treaty they want to uh, update, and this is then what we call a covered tax agreement. So then, subsequently, you need to look at each of the articles to see if there is a match at the level of the substantive provisions. And this is what we as the OECD are currently developing as a software tool. Um, to help understand the impact for the bilateral treaties. We have all the data received from all these countries, from country X and country Y, for example, for uh, Article 13. What will happen then? We know that um, through the application of the provisions, both have chosen for option A, so that applies in their bilateral treaty from now on. Article 5, 4.1 will not apply because country Y opted out. So this is the kind of tool we are currently developing to, see, to show exactly what is the impact on a bilateral level for bilateral treaties. That automatically brings me uh, to the timeline of the work we have been doing and will be doing. So uh, it's important to note that the work um, started effectively only a year ago, and we delivered, delivered the work so far on time and on budget due to uh, the hard work of the ad hoc group, Gita and my predecessor. Now there's a lot of work ahead of us. Countries themselves need to prepare the domestic procedures. Kita will say something about that. Um, but there's also a lot of work on the OCD side. And that is uh, the final thing I wanted to say, uh, bearing in mind we have little time left. Uh, we will be facilitating matching exercises between countries. We have a speed dating, made, uh, speed dating meeting in February 2017 because we are already receiving informal lists of options and reservations of countries, so we can already see where there needs to be some bilateral discussions between countries. We will also be uh, enhancing further clarity by developing more guidance, tool, uh, guidance tools, documents, presentations, maybe more webcasts like these, and also we will help preparing um, um, consolidated text of treaties. Um, we will not be producing them all them ourselves, but we can do a lot to help countries and others to make those um, consolidated texts available. And that is the cue for Gita for her last words. Okay, last words very quickly. Um, countries are now preparing for signature. We're helping them in that process. The signing ceremony will happen in the week of the 5th of June of 2017, back to back with the OECD's Ministerial Council meeting. But of course, it's open to all countries. The MLI is open to all countries uh, to sign. Uh, we expect the participation of a significant number at that June signing ceremony. Then it's up to each country to undergo its domestic ratification procedures, which will vary. Uh, we talked also about the process for translations and addressing language versions. So I'd leave you just with one thought. That is that when we started this process, many thought that it was an impossible task to develop a multilateral instrument to modify bilateral tax treaties. Now we've managed to uh, agree on this text. We need to make it work, but uh, we're very confident that that will be the case. And the final thought I would leave you with is that this may be an important precedent for updating bilateral tax treaties in a synchronized way in order to address, address an issue where there's broad consensus that coordinated action is required. So this, may, this MLI may lead the way for more innovative thinking in the future on uh, tax treaties. Thank you. Before turning to um, uh, Georgia uh, to talk about tax certainty, just an additional word, and I suppose we'll go back to that, to the questions. We've received already a great deal of questions on, on the MLI and other topics. It may sound difficult. It may sound complex. It's no more complex nor difficult than bilateral treaties. And by the way, 
bilateral treaties when amended are rarely consolidated, which makes the reading for both tax administration and taxpayer extremely complicated. So here we're in the same context. But what we will be doing in the next six months is putting in place the software, the apps, the whatever, which will provide you with consolidated versions or very clear guidelines so that and guidance so that you, taxpayers, tax administrations, tax treaties users can uh, be comfortable that it will be easy to read the bilateral treaty. So keep always that in mind. When reading the multilateral instrument, you actually need to read bilateral treaties. There is a lot of homework for member countries and uh, member countries of, of the other group and non-member countries because the, uh, the, the convention is open to all countries um, uh, in the world to join. Uh, it's their interest to make sure that uh, they can uh, make sure that their treaties are not abused because that's the core minimum standard or that the permanent establishment definition is not overcome by some practices because of the deficiencies of the writing of the bilateral uh, provision. So. Um, Keep in mind all that when reading it, and we invite you uh, to do that exercise, and we will follow up. Uh, there will be a lot of material available uh, very soon on our website. We'll also do some training for tax administration and for, for tax treaty negotiators so that people get comfortable. I will turn uh, to uh, something which is related, which is about tax certainty, because one of the ways to ensure tax certainty after the BEPS uh, package was approved was to make sure that we would not have 30 years of negotiation with many treaties updated, many not updated, many in the process of being updated by doing this at once. That's related to tax certainty, which is, as I indicated, one of the priorities of the German presidency. And Georgia will remind you of what you owe us. Press the button. Thank you very much, Pascal, and good afternoon, everybody. To uh, Sorry, yes, sorry. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. To conclude our tax talk, I would like to update you on some of our tax policy work and uh, more specifically on the work that is closely related to the G20 and the G7 tax policy agenda. As Pascal has already um, reminded you, during the September meeting, the G20 leaders have emphasized the importance of inclusive growth. Inclusive growth is a growth that works for everybody, uh, growth that benefits um, also uh, the weaker segment of society. The G20 leaders also emphasize that tax certainty, so certainty in the tax system, predictability in the tax system is very important to promote investment and trade. So it's really in this context that the OECD, together with the IMF, has been requested uh, by the G20 to work on tax certainty. The OECD is also likely to be requested by the G7 in the next few months to also work on inclusive growth. So where are we with our project on tax certainty? We have now completed an initial report to the G20 on sources of tax certainty. In this report, we, all, we, look, we focus on the sources of tax certainty and we also look at the effects on, of uncertainty in the tax system on investment and trade. We are now working on a final report that will focus on practical measures to effectively and concretely make the tax system more predictable. Some very important inputs for the project are a business survey, a survey to tax administration, and a consultation process with other stakeholders, such as civil society organizations. And here is your homework. So many of you will know that we launched uh, the business survey on the 18th of October. It will close very soon, um, uh, Friday next week on the 16th of December. And for those of you who want and should take part in our survey, I would like to reassure you that uh, the responses to our survey are completely anonymous. The results from the survey will be aggregated in our analysis, so it will not be possible to identify an individual company. Our survey is structured around some introductory sections where we ask about the characteristic of the firm, and then we have two very important sections where we ask uh, very practical questions, very concrete questions about the sources of uh, tax uncertainty and the solutions for a more predictable tax system. 
In those two very important final sections, we propose some uh, very innovative solutions, such as multilateral APAs, multilateral audits, multilateral cooperative compliance programs. So because we propose such practical solutions, it's very important to have the view of business. And for this reason, we really encourage the business community to take part in our survey. Uh, none of the questions in our survey are compulsory, so if some of the questions are not relevant or too difficult for the respondent, you can go on and submit the survey anyway. To date, we have 244 completed responses with, with more than 6,000 uncompleted, unsubmitted responses. Again, the deadline is very soon. I'll say it again. Uh, so Friday next week, the 16th of December. And because the deadline is approaching very soon, we really encourage you to submit your responses as soon as possible. You can see the link to our survey on the slide. And I can assure you that responding to our survey will make a difference because <coughs> the results will be presented to the G20 meeting in March. Also, the consultation with tax administration and civil society organizations will feed in our uh, final report and hence directly into the G20 tax policy work. Finally, I, would, uh, I want to update you on our tax and inclusive growth project. We are preparing a report for the G7 uh, meeting of the finance, minister in, uh, finance ministers in May. In that report, we will discuss and propose some policy solution for a more inclusive growth. And clearly, taxation we ha will have a very important part in that report. And to conclude, I would like to say that overall, our tax policy work should be seen in the context of our revenue statistics, where you can see that in 2015, the average tax to GDP ratio for OECD country was, countries was 34.3%. This is the highest ratio since 1965. And now did we get to that ratio? It's essentially since the financial crisis, tax revenues have shifted mm -hmm. mainly towards the personal income tax, the social security contributions, and consumption taxes, uh, particularly VAT. With respect to corporate tax revenues, they haven't bounced back to their level pre-crisis, um, and you can measure that as a percentage of GDP or as total tax revenues. And this is probably due to the long tail of the financial crisis during which many companies reported large losses. And I think with this I can conclude my intervention and I'll hand back to Pascal. Thank you. Thank you, um, Georgia. So you know what to do. I mean, 300 uh, questionnaires completed, 6,000 people who clicked. Well, for the other 5,700 people, now you need to complete the questionnaire or we'll get back to you if you have not. Uh, what's next? Um, a few key elements. You will see it's all about implementation with a question mark. BEPS implementation, countries need to implement, and there will be the reviews which have started, as Arim indicated. That's one. Uh, I should add there, because that's one of the questions, and we'll go back uh, to that one in February at the next uh, OECD tax talks. Um, it's about the transfer pricing rules. You know that we issued uh, some drafts. And there has been a very good business input and civil society input. And now the delegates are reflecting uh, on the draft on the uh, allocation of profit to permanent establishment and the draft on profit split. It may be the case that we will not rush as we thought we would uh, to conclude these uh, drafts as there are different views within the um, uh, membership uh, of the inclusive framework and that may require some more time. So. Be relaxed in a sense, it will not go out very soon, or be nervous because there will be further work uh, which may not be fully aligned with the initial draft, so some level of uncertainty in this area. The MLI implementation will be absolutely key. We've uh, extensively discussed this, and as I've told you, one of the key tasks for the OECD now is to make sure that this will be clear and transparent for all the users. CRS implementation was not the hot topic of the day, but we're working on that so that uh, the deadlines are met. And um, all that, and you see that we conclude with a question mark, 
uh, on the US tax policy reform, but we could have had many other question marks on the overall uh, landscape. Uh, we mentioned the G7 under the Italian presidency. You will have seen by now that the prime minister of Italy has resigned, uh, that they're looking for a new prime minister. And I've just read some tweets indicating that it could be the current uh, finance minister, Piercarlo Padua, and so question marks on what's going to happen in the G7. What's going to happen with the US tax reform? I think there is good news, though. It's that it's more than likely that the US tax reform will happen. And, and not only does the US badly need uh, such a tax reform, uh, but I think that uh, probably uh, there will be spillovers on, on many uh, others. And uh, we hope that these will be positive. But for sure, this will give ground to some discussions uh, internationally, whatever the reform uh, looks like in the US. So all that to say that uh, international tax will remain high on the agenda if countries want to protect their sovereignty. Uh, they do need to cooperate. And uh, the inclusive framework, the Global Forum, uh, the OECD uh, are happy to help uh, in that uh, direction. So I'll, I'll stop here. We just have a couple of minutes left and we committed to do one hour, so we'll do one hour. We've received a number of questions. So before concluding or closing down, I will try to respond to, to some of them. And sorry, we've been a bit long, but there was a lot to say. A couple of questions on the multilateral instrument. One is, is it in the interest of countries to sign? Well, the answer is yes, absolutely. I mean, if you want to protect your sovereignty, which was the second question, isn't it giving up your sovereignty to uh, sign this multilateral instrument? No. I mean, your sovereignty is to negotiate a bilateral treaty to make sure that you decide what you do with country B, country C, country D, country whatever. But when you have treaty shopping, you don't decide. It's, it's the users who decide which treaty they will use. The MLI will be a way to restore the bilateral nature of tax treaties. It's a bit paradoxical to use a multilateral instrument to get there, but this actually is the outcome. It's also the interest of all countries, OECD countries, G20 countries, developing countries, and that's why I think we had so many countries participating in the negotiation of this instrument. Um, we, we had another question uh, on uh, whether the MLI uh, does um, reach the balance between source countries and residence countries. And the answer is, well, yes and no. Yes, because it is about restoring the bilateral treaties by fighting base erosion and profit shifting. No, because that's not its purpose to change the balance between residents and source. So the balance has been reached in the bilateral relationship. This is the hard law. That's not about the OECD model or the UN model. What is at stake here are the actual hard law instruments, the bilateral treaties. And these bilateral treaties will be restored uh, because they, they were not properly uh, used uh, by taxpayers because of the ability of these taxpayers to, to do some shopping with the treaty. So it's not really the question. It doesn't mean that this question is not important. It will be addressed on the way forward, but uh, uh, not in the instance of the multilateral instrument. Uh, Arim, and that will be uh, the last uh, uh, comment. Um, we, we do have a question on the fact that on our, I'm reading the question, on the online site, uh, we do uh, include no info, we don't include any information on whether countries uh, will not trigger local filing cases where an MNE group uh, files voluntarily. Can you please um, uh, give um, some elements of response? Yes, I'll have to get the last question. Um, that question, I think we have answered in the June guidance. In the June guidance that we've issued, we said very clearly that if you meet those conditions where you're doing surrogate filing, whether you're doing in the parent and the home jurisdiction or in a third jurisdiction, if you meet those requirements, then there will be no local filing obligation. So, so that's the guidance that we have agreed. Not me here sitting in my room, but the inclusive framework, all the members have agreed that. That will form the basis of the review that we will be doing. So that's part of the standard. We're not aware that there's anybody who wishes to do it differently, but certainly if that comes to our attention, we will be reviewing it. And the guidance is very clear. There is no local filing if you do surrogate filing consistent with the guidance we issued in June. Thank you. Thank you, Arim. Thank you all for uh, listening in, uh, for sending questions. Uh, 
Um, we will keep working on all these topics. Uh, mm -hmm. We will take a short break and I wish you a, a happy holidays uh, at the end of the month. And we'll be back probably in February after the plenary of the inclusive framework, but you will soon receive tweets and uh, communication indicating you the date of the next webcast. Uh, and I wish you a good day and look forward to talking to you again uh, through another webcast. Thank you very much.